رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب اله العالمين ابي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا نبلو أنكم بالشيء من الخوف وجوع ونقص من الأموال وأنفس والثمرات فبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة فقالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون صدق الله العلي العظيم Tonight is a night of ibadat as well as the commemoration of the martyrdom of the Ahlul Bayt as such once again, these last night, nine nights, we've ensured that we begin our discussion by the recitation of Du'a Faraj. The day of Ashura is a day of Masa'ib for Imam Zaman. Imam Zaman, when he himself describes his condition on the day of Ashura, he says, I am the one who cries tears of blood for my father, Hussein. So on this day, in this night, we want to remember the difficulties that our Imam is going through as well too. And if we are sad for the Shahadat of Imam Hussein, the Imam of our time is also very sad for the Shahadat of Imam Hussein. So let's all collectively raise our voices, recite Dua Faraj that may Allah hasten his reappearance and protect him and give him comfort in this time of difficulty for him. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات In the continuing discussion we have about clearing doubts around certain concepts within Islam we've covered a large variety of topics Today I want to circle back to close a loop that we began on our first discussion. Our first discussion, if you remember, was about why did the event of Karbala have to happen? And we talked about the historical significance, we talked about the spiritual significance, we talked about establishing a guide in the absence of the Imam of what was expected for the people and how they should find the truth in relationship to what Allah really wants from them. Tonight's discussion and question begins with the conversation of why did Imam Hussein have to sacrifice everything? Why did Imam Hussein have to go through this process of where he made this grand sacrifice? In this, there are a few different sub-questions that we can answer to try and get an understanding. Now, the difference between the first conversation and the last conversation, or not the last, but tonight's conversation, is the difference between halat al-am, the general condition of the benefit of the event of Karbala, and tonight we're discussing the shakhsi, the individual, the specific individual characteristic of the sacrifice of Imam Hussein. One of the things that I've presented to you over these past few nights is to give you more intellectual proofs to allow the, your intellect to accept that the religion of Islam makes sense. We're not just a religion based on ritual, which is why many times the explanations and the proofs and the conversations we've had have talked about the intellectual points and the points that your intellect submits to to accept the fact that what Islam is asking you to do makes sense and it's not just a general ritual that's been applied to you. That the personalities that we honor, the religion that we follow, has complete and absolute sense of how it relates to your day-to-day -day life. The same way tonight's conversation when we talk about the personality of Imam Hussein and the sacrifice of Imam Hussein, 
It's not something that's hidden from the reality of why such a sacrifice was made or what were the conditions present that necessitated this sacrifice. So it's an educational portion that the more we appreciate and understand Imam Hussein, the more likely we are to be closer to him and appreciate him and be entitled to receive his shifa in dunya and akhirah. Remember something, when I say the shifa of Imam Hussein in dunya and akhirah, what that means is, is that there are times when, for example, that I want something or I want to achieve something, and I myself am incapable of doing that action myself or receiving that action myself. So what I do is I ask people for help who are capable in that industry. For example, many people don't pay their taxes or do their taxes themselves. They pay their taxes, they don't do their, their taxes. They go to an accountant and they hire the accountant. They say that I have an obligation, they have, I have something I have to do, but I don't know enough about this field or I don't know how to do this properly myself, so I need assistance to accomplish it. In the same sense, there are certain du'as that we want answered by Allah. There are certain favors we want Allah to grant us in dunya and then in akhirah. In akhirah, the favor that we want is what? We all want to go to heaven, right? Anybody here not want to go to heaven? That's another conversation. We all want to go to heaven. But maybe we're not capable of going ourselves, so we want someone who has the ability to get us into heaven, to have a relationship that when I call on him, he acknowledges me. Same thing in dunya. The wasila of Imam Hussein is important because why Allah has given him special statuses for his sacrifice. There are three characteristics that Imam Hussein possesses that no one else possesses because of his sacrifice. One, is that all of the other Imams are from the sons of Imam Hussein alayhi That all of the other Imams that came, came as the children of Imam Hussein. Two, that the dirt from the grave of Imam Hussein has shifa for you and can cure your sicknesses. This is a really significant point. Because the grave, eating dirt, because man was created from clay, was created from dirt, Allah said for you to eat clay is haram and forbidden. Our sixth Imam went so far as to say that if someone died from eating dirt, I wouldn't pray his Salat al mayit I wouldn't pray on his Janazah. But look how all of the dirt in the world is haram for you. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, Allah says that you can eat the dirt from the grave of Imam Hussein like medicine. And it will give you a cure for all of your sicknesses and diseases by the right of the sacrifice that Imam Hussein made. And the third, the point of Shifa that's even bigger than that is that Allah said that one who goes to the grave of Hussein ibn Ali and stands under his dome and makes dua, I will answer his dua. That dua will be answered for certain. So the same way that I want these duas to be answered when I go to the grave of Imam Hussein, I have to know who I'm talking to. I have to appreciate what this person sacrificed. I have to respect his position and know who I'm talking to to be able to receive these benefits from him. Otherwise, there's no point in these benefits. So tonight's conversation of why Imam Hussein sacrificed everything, we're going to mention in a few points. One, who are the enemies of Imam Hussein in Karbala? Two, what's the difference between the stance of Imam Hassan and the stance of Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Three, why do Imams not commit sins? And finally, the fourth point is understanding from all of these aspects what the great and mighty status of Abu Abdullah Imam Hussein is in the eyes of Allah. So we'll begin our discussion with these four points, inshallah, with your loudest of salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Our first section, who are the enemies of Imam Hussein in the field of Karbala? Sometimes the people who criticize us for, for commemorating and for spending the time on days like this and for 10 nights that we come and cry, some people have a real problem with us. They say, ah, this is so strange. Why do you perform this action? And when they look into the waqia of Karbala, they turn around and they say, why are you even crying about this affair? You Shia are the ones who killed your own Imam. What does this have to do with anyone else? Why do you commemorate it? And the argument is presented that the city of Kufa was a Shia city, and that the army of Umar Isad came from the city of Kufa, and they were the ones who were responsible for the Shahadat of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. One who makes this point is very unaware of what actually happened in history and we have to pay attention to what happened in history and that's why the first point that we're discussing is a historical point. It's true that the Khilafat of Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he began his Khilafat, he was in the city of Medina. And what happened was when Imam Ali had to raise an army, the people of Medina raised maybe 700 or 600 soldiers. They said, we're tired of fighting. We fought for the second Khalifa. We did all of these things. We don't want to fight anymore. 
And when the religion of Islam was in danger from the enemies and Imam Ali salam needed an army in the battle of Jamal to defend the Muslimin, the people of Medina didn't support him. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, he received an army and a great amount of support from the city of Kufa. And then he went and he fought in the battle of Jamal. And after this battle, he moved the capital of Islam from Medina to the city of Kufa. There's a number of reasons why, for example, there's a discussion about why Amir al-Mu'mineen did this. And briefly, we'll mention two of them. One discussion is to say, is that because the people of Medina were not willing to fight, and it was the historical city of the birthplace, or not the birthplace, but the establishment of the government of Rasulullah, and it contained many of the tabarrukat and the history of Rasulullah, Amir al-Mu'mineen didn't want that if an enemy should come and attack him, they should attack him in the city of the Holy Prophet, and the city of the, the sanctity of that city should be disrupted. So he said, let me move to a city that doesn't have the heritage of Islam associated with it. The other reason that popularly says is that the, since the soldiers and Kufa was a garrison town where soldiers were stationed. He said, since the soldiers are stationed here and they're loyal to me, rather than me be in a city and have to move the entire army to me so that we have soldiers ready to listen to my command, I'll move to the city and establish this as a central base of governance. So Amir al-Mu'mineen moved his capital from the city of Medina to the city of Kufa. This is where it became famous that Kufa became a Shia city because the people there loved and appreciated the family of the Ahlul Bayt and loved and supported Imam Ali alayhi salam to the extent where we see three battles in the history of the four and a half years of the Khilafat of Amir al-Mu'mineen take place, and the majority of the support comes from the city of Kufa. We see the battle of Jamal is fought, the support comes from Kufa. We see the battle of Nahrawan, where the enemies of Islam attacked Amir al-Mu'mineen is fought with the people of Kufa. We see the battle of Sifin against Muawiyah is fought with the people from the city of Kufa. So all of these people were loyal to Amir al-Mu'mineen and they were willing to sacrifice their lives for Imam Ali and they were the true soldiers of Imam Ali alayhi Now what happens in history is, is after the shahadat of Amir al-Mu'mineen, that Imam Hassan comes to, the uh, comes to the Khilafat, he becomes the leader of the time. And when he becomes the leader of the time, Muawiyah brings an army to attack Imam Hassan alayhi And the soldiers of Imam Hassan aren't very loyal to him, they don't want to fight anymore. They said, we would have fought for your father, but we're tired of fighting now. We don't want to fight anymore. And they didn't support Imam Hassan. And Muawiyah then became the Khalifa of the time. Once Muawiyah became the Khalifa of the time, and now he's in charge of the city of Kufa as well as the other cities, he knows that the city of Kufa is where the support of Imam Ali and his enemies are based. He knows that this is a Shia town and all the Shias are there. He doesn't want to have a city in his system of governance, in his nation, that is loyal to Imam Ali, that again an attack could be raised against Muawiyah from that city. So what does Muawiyah do? He takes the clans that were loyal to Imam Ali and shifts them around the entire Muslim empire and out of the city of Kufa. And he replaces them with people who are loyal to Muawiyah, that Muawiyah could buy their loyalty. So that the city of Kufa is no longer a stronghold of the Shia. These people who came into the city of Kufa at this point in time were essentially soldiers from different places who were loyal to Muawiyah because he paid them good amounts of money. They were what we would call mercenaries in today's day and age. That as long as you pay them well, they're happy. And they'll fight for you and they'll do whatever you want. So Muawiyah said, these are the people I want in Kufa. So that that way, if an uprising begins in Kufa, I can pay them off and they'll fight for me. They won't uprise against my government. And we know this because we saw that personalities like Hujar ibn Adi and Kumail ibn Ziyad and people who were loyal, Maytham ibn Tamar, who were loyal to Amir al-Mu'mineen and who wouldn't leave the city of Kufa were assassinated in the city of Kufa to destroy the backbone of support of the Shia in the city of Kufa. Once this was accomplished and we knew that Kufa now went from being a town loyal to Amir al-Mu'mineen to being a town that was loyal to money, Muawiyah said, I have nothing to worry about from Kufa, I'm done with it. And for 20 years it stayed in this condition that it became a city of mercenaries. But as long as Muawiyah was in power, in the beginning he paid these people a lot of money. He made them really happy, gave them lots of money. But eventually, he stopped paying them. He stopped caring about them. And I said, hey, we moved, we left our families and our homes to move to this town for you. And Muawiyah was like, yeah, I paid you, we're done. And he forgot about them. And he didn't treat them nicely anymore. And the governors that he put in the city of Kufa weren't good people. They were bad people. So people became frustrated with the system of governance of Muawiyah even though they had received money for him. So now, when Muawiyah drops dead, 
these same people, they turn around, they say, we heard that in this city there was a good time had when, the, when Ali ibn Abi Talib and his children used to rule the city, when they were the ones in charge. So now, the people who called to Imam Hussein were not the true loyal supporters of Ahlul Bayt. Rather, they were people who were looking for a better system of governance than the city, than the governance of Muawiyah. And there were people who were loyal to money. So, they turned around and they said, Muawiyah doesn't pay us anymore. The Banu Umayyah aren't taking care of us. They mistreat us. Let's call their adversary and make him our leader. And if we make him our leader, then we can overthrow this government and we'll get back to making some money. So the people from Kufa who called to Imam Hussein to bring him were not the Shia. They were people who were opportunists looking for an opportunity to get back into good money and good power. And they wrote letters upon letters upon letters upon letters to call Imam Hussein. And they called him to the city of Kufa. And when Imam Hussein came, we saw that these same people, now that the governor, now that the Khalifa was paying attention to them and was offering them money, they became loyal to that Khalifa and that governor and became the enemies of Imam Hussein. So when the argument is made that, for example, that, oh, the Shia of Kufa, Kufa was a Shia city and they were the ones who were responsible for the killing of Imam Hussein, this is a fallacy. It's a lie. Someone doesn't know the familiarity of what actually happened in history and that Muawiyah broke the Shia control over the city of Kufa. Now, Kufa, historically and until today, is known as a stronghold of the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. To the extent where during the life of the sixth Imam, a man came and he said, he had his donkey packed with all of his goods and he says, Salam alaykum ya ibn Rasulullah. Imam said, alaykum as -salam. He says, I'm moving. Imam says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to move to Mecca. I'm going to move to the Kaaba. I'm going to live next to the house of Allah. And the Imam told him, he says, but the city of the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt is Kufa. It's better for you to stay in Kufa and stay in the place where the people love the Ahlul Bayt than to move to Mecca and the Kaaba where it's shrouded by the enemies and the people who are munafiqeen in the religion of Islam. So the Imam is giving instruction that the city of the Shia is Kufa. So it's true, even till today it's recommended for the Mu'mineen that the place that you should go is the city of Kufa if you want to be our supporters. Why? We know for example that Masjid al-Kufa will be the headquarters of the government of Sahib al-Asr wa-Zaman Ajjalallahu ta'ala farju wa And the Ahlul Bayt have described that our Shia live in the city of Kufa. It's true that at a time, the governance had managed to change the culture of this city and make it, made it a mercenary city, which is why the enemies came against Imam Hussein from the city. But since that time until today, it has become a place where the Imams have indicated that this is a place where our Shia gather and our Shia await the Lahur of the master of the time. So when we take a look and we see, the first point we notice is, is that those who killed Imam Hussein were not necessarily the Shia, rather they were mercenaries. They were people who came to the city of Kufa and lived in the city of Kufa because they were paid to live there and they were soldiers. The next point of our conversation, what's the difference between Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein? When we look at history, we see that Imam Hassan salam, in his Khilafat, when he established his Khilafat, and he was going to fight Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, he made a peace treaty with Muawiyah. And then they say that the next time there was a change in governance when Imam Hussein could have made a peace treaty with Yazid, Imam Hussein decided to fight Yazid. Some people make an argument to say that this was a difference in personalities. Na'uzubillah. To say that Imam Hassan was a peace-loving person and therefore he made peace and Imam Hussein was an angry person and therefore he made war. This is a misunderstanding of the entire concept of Imam. One of the things you have to understand about an Imam is an Imam does what's right for the time period to protect the religion of Islam. There's a discussion by some of our ulama that say that had you switched the place of our sixth Imam and Imam Hussein, if you place the, change the place of Imam Sadiq and Imam Hussein, they both would have done the same thing. Imam Sadiq would have been the one who would have fought in Karbala and Imam Hussein would have been the one who taught in the system of education. Point being that an Imam's personality has no entrance into the affairs as he dictates them in society. Rather, an Imam makes the decision based on the time what's the best way to protect the religion of Islam. In the time of Imam Hassan, the best thing to do was to make peace to protect the Muslimin. And in the time of Imam Hussein, the best thing to do was to stand up and defend the religion of Islam. There's a verse in Surah An-Nisa, verse 77, the tafsir of which our fifth Imam provides. The verse reads, "Alam tara ilal ladina qila lahum kuffu aydiyakum wa aqimus salat wa atu zakat, 
فلما كتب عليهم القتال إذا فريق منهم يخشون الناس كخشية الله أو شد خشية وقالوا ربنا لما كتبت علينا الكتاب لولا كتاب لولا أخذنا إلى أجل قريب. The translation of this verse is this. Allah is saying in Surah An-Nisa in verse 77, He says, Don't you see those people who when they were told to stop fighting and to perform salat and give zakat, that afterwards when they were told that they should stand up and fight, they became afraid of people like they fear Allah or they were more afraid of people than they were afraid of Allah. And they complained to Allah, Oh Allah, why did you tell us to fight? Why didn't you delay the fight, fighting to another point in time? Our fifth Imam, he goes through and he explains this verse of Quran. He says the tafsir of this verse, or one of the tafsirs of this verse, occurred after the revelation of the Quran. That it was Imam Hassan's time period that the people were told that keep your hands away from fighting, stop fighting. That this is the, not the time for you to fight against Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan and wait. And that after that, when they were told to fight, when it was the time of Imam Hussein, they were told to fight. And they became afraid of people like they feared Allah. They were more afraid of what people would do to them than what Allah would do to them. And therefore they complained to Allah, Allah, why did you tell us to fight? Why didn't you tell us not to fight and we'll fight later? We don't want to fight now. So Imam Bakr says, he says that these two descriptions of when they were told to hold off their hand of fighting is the time of Imam Hassan. And when they were told to fight and they refused to fight was the time of Imam Hussein. And he says, I swear to you, what Imam Hassan did in his time is better than any deed that has been performed on this earth at any point in time. So they said, Ibn Rasulullah, how is it that what Imam Hassan did is better than what was done at any point in time? So Imam Hassan begins an uh, Imam Bakr begins an explanation. He says, when Imam Hassan made the decision not to fight Muawiyah and make peace, the people of Kufa used to curse Imam Hassan. Supposedly the Shia used to curse Imam Hassan and they would say, when they would see him in the streets, they would say, Assalamu alaykum ya mudhill al mu'mineen. Salam to you, O oh, disgrace of the Muslimin, disgrace of the believers. Na'uzubillah, they talk to Imam Hassan like this. Now understand something. The lesson here is to understand that when you, in, you deal with an Imam, don't assume that you can understand the responsibilities of an Imam. What happened was that they came to a disagreement with the Imam. They didn't believe in the decision of the Imam and they thought that what the Imam did was a disgrace for Islam. How evil was that? The lesson here is for us. They had the Imam in front of them. The Imam was present with them. But still they could not accept the authority of the Imam. Our period of ghaybat that's here now is so that we don't behave like that with our Imam. And when Imam Zaman comes to us, if he makes a decision, we don't question his decision. We don't argue with him. We recognize that the authority of the Imam is absolute and whatever he does is for the best. So when they would come to Imam Hassan in the streets and say, Assalamu alaikum ya mudhal al mu'mineen. Oh, salam to you, oh disgrace of the mu'mineen, disgrace of the believers. Imam Hassan didn't take this sitting down. He would reply to them, I am not the disgrace of the believers, rather I am the one who protected you from destruction. Imam Hassan would tell them, he says, I found in you weakness where you would not stand up for the religion of Islam. If I would have taken you few believers and we would have fought against Muawiyah, we would have been wiped out and there would have been no remainder of true Islam left on this earth. O oh, foolish mu'mineen, I am the one who prepared for you and set for you like the Ark of Nuh to protect you in these dangers. And had I not made this Ark of Nuh by creating this treaty with Muawiyah, you would have all been destroyed and nothing would have been left. This was the teaching to show what was the reasoning behind why Imam Hassan made peace at that time because the believers weren't strong to support him. And Imam Hussein, in his time, it was necessary for him to fight and he said to himself, he says, I have been given companions such as that not even my grandfather Rasulullah, not my father Imam Ali, and not my brother Imam Hassan were given. Had such companions existed at the time of Imam Hassan, he would have stood up too, but they didn't come. They didn't stand in support of the Imam of the time. So the difference we see between the decision of Imam Hassan to make peace was that peace what was necessary to protect Mu'mineen and keep the message of Islam alive. The same way when we take a look at the attack of Imam Hussein and the fight that Imam Hussein took, that's what was necessary at the time to defend and protect the religion of Islam. Which is why any Imam who came 
any Imam who came and performed an action for the protection of Islam, it was not his personality that they were showing off and demonstrating what they themselves chose. Rather, they were saying that had any one of us been in this position, we would have made the same decision because our responsibility is always to defend the religion of Islam and to ensure that the message of Allah is protected on this earth. You guys still awake? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The next point that we get into to understand all of these points that we need are necessary to answer the question that we have that why did Imam Hussein sacrifice everything? So we're seeing first off we saw that who were the enemies? These enemies were not necessarily the Shia but rather they were people who were able to be bought and sold that they didn't truly care about the religion of Islam therefore it was necessary for the Imam to stand up. Two, we saw that the Imam did perform the actions that were necessary in his time and it wasn't that he was showing his personality to say that oh my personality is one that likes to fight billah, and my brother's personality was one that likes to make peace. The next question that we need to understand is why don't the Imams commit sins? Sometimes when we think about the idea that the Imam is ma'soom, the Imam is sinless, the Imam can't make a mistake, what we like to imagine is that the Imam is a personality, walks around, does things, and when he's about to do something, an angel comes and whispers in his ear, hey, shh, don't do that. Or that he tries to do something and Allah sends an angel and blocks him, or Allah doesn't show him the opportunities, therefore the Imam doesn't commit a sin. This idea that it's a miracle every time the Imam doesn't commit a sin, means that the Imam himself, his personality is not special. That it could be anybody that as long as they don't commit a sin or as long as Allah is there to protect them, that they wouldn't commit a sin. This devalues the personality of the Imam and doesn't let us understand truly what an Imam is. An Imam doesn't avoid sin because Allah makes it a miracle for him that he protects him and hides him from the sins. The same way we talked about yesterday. That it's not that the Holy Prophet was a normal person and he wanted to commit sins and that Allah protected him. The same way an Imam is not a normal person who wants to commit sin and Allah protects him from sin. Rather, there is an intellectually sound reason and an intellectual process to the masumiyah, to the isma, to the sinlessness of an imam. And this is a much longer discussion where we could spend 10 nights just discussing this, but very briefly I'm going to give you an explanation about this. What prevents an imam from committing a sin against Allah is his intellect, is his knowledge. The imams themselves explain, for us, the reason that we avoid sinning is, is we see the reality and the consequence of that sin and that prevents us and makes it something filthy and ugly in front of us and we don't want to perform that action. So meaning the more complete the knowledge of the Imam is, and the Imam's knowledge is absolutely complete, when you have complete knowledge, you don't want to do something bad because you know its consequences. When you don't know the consequences of your action, when you're unaware of what the consequence of your action is, you may choose to do it, you may choose not to do it, it becomes arbitrary, it becomes something, eh, I did it, I didn't do it. Let me give you an example. As time has gone on, more and more knowledge and information has been provided to society. There were things that we were ignorant about, we didn't know about and we did them and now that we've learned about them, we try to avoid them. I'll give you a few examples. Smoking cigarettes. There was a time that people didn't know and didn't understand the consequences of what would happen to their health, what would happen to their body, what would happen to their life if they smoked cigarettes, and so therefore they smoked cigarettes. As time went on, we became more and more educated about the consequences, about the problems, about the dangers to our health, the dangers to our family, the impact of secondhand smoke to our children, how you can't smell things, and all of these characteristics. The more we learned about smoking, the more we decided that this isn't an action to perform. And the one who knew even more about smoking, he said that this is something I don't like at all and I don't want to perform this action. Does that mean that Allah stopped him from performing that action or that his knowledge that was more complete prevented him from going down this path and making this mistake? The same way, for example, when we learned about diseases, heart disease, when we learned about diabetes, we recognize that this disease impacts our lifestyle and there are certain decisions that we make in our life that if we make them, it'll make us more susceptible to this disease. If we eat oily and fatty foods, we don't exercise, our cholesterol can go up, and we can be affected by heart disease. 
If we eat a lot of sugar, if we don't balance our diet and our work, if we're careless about the food that we eat, we can develop diabetes and we can become sick. As our intellect was improved and our awareness and the flaws and the problems with these actions became more and more familiar with us, we became more and more cautious about not making these mistakes. We became more and more cautious about avoiding these things that cause harm to us. We saw that as our intellect and our knowledge about certain affairs improved, we avoided those mistakes. The same concept applies to the Imam. That the Imam, when he avoids a sin, it's not because there's an angel sitting there protecting him and keeping him away and saying, ah, 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 don't do that now. Or that Allah sends someone to whisper in his ear and say, this is a bad thing, don't do this. The Imam says, my knowledge is sufficient to know the consequences of this sin and the benefits of following the religion of Allah. And I prefer because my intellect shows me the filth and the dirt of the sin to keep myself away from filth and dirt and disease and sickness and stay with the path of what Allah chooses for me. So when an Imam makes an action, it's because his intellect is teaching him and giving him the instruction and the guidance that he needs to ensure that his actions are in line with what Allah likes and not in line with what Allah dislikes. The same way for us, our goal, one of our major responsibilities is the gaining of knowledge and to learn about the religion of Islam. This is why the benefits about studying and learning about Islam are so many. There's so many benefits to it. That for example, if you leave your house to study about Islam and you should die on the way, that you die the death of a shaheed. That when you leave your house to go and study about the religion of Islam, the whales in the ocean, every creation of Allah prays for your safety and your protection. That the ibadat of one who is a knowledgeable person is 70 times greater than the ibadat of one who is a worshiper. The difference, right? The Imam explains the difference in hell between the one who is knowledge about, knowledgeable about Islam and the one who is a worshiper of Islam is 70 levels of heaven. Where the distance between each level is the running of a horse for either 1,000 years or 7,000 years. That that's that distance. So they asked, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, why is there such a great difference between the knowledgeable one and the worshipper? They're both working for Islam. One spends his time in prayer and fasting and reading of Quran. The other one thinks about the religion of Islam. Why did you make one so much or why did Allah make one so much greater than the other? The Imam replies, he says, the Abid, when shaitan approaches him with innovation, when the worshipper is approached with innovation from shaitan to take him away from the path of Allah, he doesn't know better and he accepts it and he allows innovation to creep into his worship. But the scholar is the one like a guardian who stands on the boundary of Islam and protects Islam from the innovations and the attacks of Islam. Therefore, Allah raised the guardian to a very high status above even the one who worships. So our goal is spend some time in your life to study about the religion of Islam, to learn about Islam continuously. I gave this example a few nights ago to somebody as we were talking that we learn to pray by the age of 10 generally, all of us know how to pray. But if you're 50, and you're still praying the same way you prayed when you're 10, your salat hasn't changed, your worship hasn't changed, you've done a disservice to your religion. You stop growing. Your capacity is the capacity of a 10 year old. As we grow and we mature, we have to learn about our worship. We have to learn about what Allah asked us, so that we increase and improve as life goes along. The same way, inshallah, as we become professionals in our careers, it's become known in society. That once you graduate college, once you finish with your professional degree, there's something called continuing education. There's something called improving your knowledge base. Because you can't continue to grow in your profession if you don't continue to grow your knowledge. The same way in Islam, how can you continue to grow and be a good Muslim if you don't learn and study about your religion and make it a part of your lifestyle? These are necessary responsibilities. There is continuing education in Islam. This is the course catalog for continuing education in Islam. This is where we introduce you to a variety of topics that give you the responsibility that you go and you educate yourself about your faith so that you continue to grow your faith as your life goes along. It's not something static. It's not something basic. Now, when we understand, you're still with me, right? We're good? Very briefly, we're going through a lot of topics. You guys are okay? All right, one loud salawat and we'll continue. <laughs> When we 
began our discussion, we began our verse discussion with the verses of, this, of Surah Baqarah, verse 155, 156, which are very famous. <laughs> الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة فقالوا say with me إنا لله إنا إليه راجعون when we talk about the completion of the intellect we learn that as my intellect becomes more complete and I understand better the religion of Islam one of the things that I realize and I understand is is that this isn't a place of happiness and peace this world this world is a testing ground. I'm here to take a test. And when you sit in a test, the answers should be hard for you to achieve because it means you have to struggle for them and work for them. If this was a place of peace and happiness for me, what would be the point? How would I get to heaven? To get to heaven, I have to earn heaven. I have to go through difficulties. I have to go through challenges. I have to go and I have to take this test. And the test, Allah is telling you how I will test you. He says, And we will test you with something from fear, with hunger, loss of wealth, challenges within yourself, and from your fruits. It doesn't literally mean the fruit you keep in your house that tomorrow the cantaloupe will become a test for you. It's not what Allah is talking about. He's talking about your children, your lineage. Allah says, These are all of the categories by which I will give you a test in this world. Sometimes you'll be afraid for your safety and security. That the challenge and the test will come to you through an example where you're afraid. Am I safe? Am I in danger? How do I survive in this environment? And we see around the world, whether you live in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Yemen, Sham, Bahrain, Qatif, all, is, even China. That if you're a Muslim, one of the tests that you face, even in this country, is the test of fear. Am I safe or am I being attacked because of my religion? <coughs> Sometimes, <laughs> it's hunger. That Allah doesn't give you resources that are sufficient to take care of yourself. You live your life in a state of difficulty where you don't have sufficiency to take care of yourself. Sometimes it's that you get wealth and Allah gives you and He gives you a lot and then all of a sudden you face a loss. And it's nothing that you did wrong. I didn't do anything wrong, but I lost all of it. Allah wants to see what's your character like? Who are you? What kind of a person are you? Do you really believe in me and do you have certainty that Allah is present or do you not? And sometimes you face a loss in yourself through sickness, through illness, through accidents. And Allah tests you. He says, I took something away from you. Will you still worship me or will you run away from me? And we see this, that when someone is tested in their life, when for example a parent loses a child at a young age, when a man goes through a car accident and winds up ill and sick, when we go through in business and we have a great loss, when we have family relationships that break up, when we are in a state of fear, some people we see, they go through the test and some people we see they run away from Islam. And other people we see when the test comes to them, they get closer and closer to Allah. And they invest in getting closer to Allah. Allah is telling you, all five of these things I will test you with, with fear, with hunger, with loss of wealth, with sicknesses and illnesses in yourself, and with losses from your children and your families. And then he continues, he says, those of you who succeed in this test, فَبَشِّرِ sabirin, Give good news to the people who are patient. Now here's something really important. What is patience? Patience through a trial and difficulty is not simply just living through the experience. Sometimes we think I'm being patient that, for example, I went through a difficulty and I'm still alive, I'm still present. That's not patience. Patience is to pass a difficulty without stressing and hurting and affecting the people around you and containing that difficulty to yourself. The true patient person, the one who is patient, is the one that when he goes through a difficulty, the people around him can't even tell he's going through a difficulty. Many times it happens, we go through a difficulty. For example, uh, someone hit my car this morning. Alhamdulillah, no one hit my car. But if someone hit my car this morning, the whole day now, I'm going to be in a bad mood and I'm going to take it out on everybody I see. Everybody needs to know the problem I had. Everybody needs to know that I have a problem and they should feel bad for me. Or I have a bad day at work. I come home and what do I do? I take it out on my wife. Don't come near me, get away from me. I take it out on my children. Get away from me. 
That's not patience in the face of a difficulty. Patience in the face of a difficulty, sabr that Allah rewards you for, is something that its impact doesn't affect society, but rather you absorb it within yourself and that's between you and your creator. The loss of a child is a very difficult thing. In Islam, there is a book written by one of the great scholars, Shahid Thani, who writes a book called uh, Musakkin al Fu'ad, the, the, heart, the comforter of the heart, or the medication to protect your heart from sadness. Shahid Thani, who wrote Kitab al Lum'a, that studied in the Hawza till today, all of his children died when they were young. All of his children. They didn't make it past the age of toddlers. And as he went through these losses and difficulty, he saw that I'm not the only one who's suffering from these problems. There are many people who go through these difficulties. So he wrote a book about how to cope with and deal with these problems in life. And he talked about what the reward is and how to attain that reward for, for example, losing a child in life. For example, and, and this isn't a simple section, this is just a brief description to tell you that this information exists and it's even available in English. You can find these books in English. And you can read about this information of how these ulama prepared it. But one of the narrations that he says, is he says that our Holy Prophet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah 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 When an innocent child dies, when someone who's not baligh, who has no obligation, dies, when he will come before Allah on the Day of Judgment, there's no questioning for that person, right? When you become baligh, then you have something that's wajib upon you. Until you become baligh, there's nothing wajib upon you. You have no obligation. So when you die in that state, when God forbid Allah takes a child from a parent in that stage, that child is innocent. They have no sins. So the Holy Prophet says, for that child, there's no questioning. When the day of judgment comes and everyone will be gathered in the field of mahsha, Allah will turn to these children who are present in the field and say, go to heaven. There's no questioning for you. And our Holy Prophet, now I'm not narrating this, the Holy Prophet is narrating. He says those children, when they will come to the doors of Jannah, they will refuse to enter. And Allah will call out, why don't you enter? I've given you permission to enter into heaven. And they will say, and what about our parents? And Allah will say, take them with you and enter into heaven. Understand how powerful that is that to lose someone in that phase, Allah says that you went through such a difficult loss, for this I give you entrance into heaven without a question with your child. <laughs> Meaning that anything we go through in this life, any difficulty we go through, any test that we go through, there is a reward associated with it, and sometimes the reward is very great. Yes, it's difficult. It's very difficult for a parent to lose a child. But one who takes it with patience, the way Allah has described it, that be patient, the reward is even greater than that. So we take a look and we see that all of these are teaching us to have patience. These verses that we talk about, be patient in your trials. Don't take out your difficulties on others. In some narrations it says that one who in his difficulty even goes so far as to strike his knee. Out of frustration, Allah removes something from the reward that he's entitled to. If we had yaqeen, if we had knowledge and certainty of what Allah gives us for the difficulties that we bear patiently, we wouldn't be upset about anything. Rather, we would be calm in the face of those difficulties because we know what Allah has guaranteed for us is greater than the test that we're going through. Now, take all of this and let's look back at our question. Why did Imam Hussein sacrifice everything on the day of judgment? On the day of, well, come on, man. On the day of Ashura. Come on, I get it. Stuck. You guys have to recite a salawat to keep me awake too. Salawat. Oh, Allah. We've explained that an imam has perfect knowledge of what Allah wants and that perfect knowledge that he has keeps him away from sin. The same way now that perfect knowledge, the imam is well aware of the rewards that he's entitled to and what it is that Allah wants to see when he's faced with a difficulty is patience and perseverance through challenges. And we see that Allah has taught us in the Quran, وَقُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَاءِ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That the mu'min is the one who Allah says, if you have faith in me, then say that certainly my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, my death is all for the sake of Allah. 
So the one who has perfect knowledge will embody these characteristics perfectly. Therefore, when the day of Ashura came, and Imam Hussein found himself in a condition where if he submitted to the evil authority, the religion of Allah would be affected. He stood up against it and said that my knowledge tells me that though this day is a day of trial and tribulation and difficulty, and I will have to lose everything on this day, but the religion of Allah will be protected. The Imam was happy to give away everything that he had. Which is why one of the questions that happens that some people make is that wasn't what Imam Hussein did on the day of Ashura suicide? Na'uzubillah. This is an actual question that people have and they ask sometimes. The definition of suicide is to kill oneself for a difficulty that they are facing. That for example, I have a problem or I have a sickness and because of that sickness, I can't bear that sickness so I remove and I end my life. The difference from that to a martyr is someone who faces death and faces difficulty and tribulation for the sake of protecting a cause and a reason. The death of Imam Hussein, the shahadat of Imam Hussein, was not something that happened because of something he wanted, or that he was facing, or a problem that he had. No, the Imam was patient. Rather, his shahadat was to defend the message of Islam and protect the message of Islam. Therefore, because if we know this aspect of what is suicide and what is a martyrdom, we can acknowledge that this is martyrdom because it's for the cause and the sake of Allah and not because of the personal difficulty Imam was going through. That's an important thing to understand. That we don't misvalue and mislabel these characteristics of the Imam. If the Imam stood up against an army and an enemy that he knew he could not have victory against, it was not or that he knew he could not live against. It was not because he felt bad for himself or he was in difficulty and therefore he didn't fight and defend himself, no. Rather the message of the Imam was that this fight is worth fighting even if I have to give my life up for it. Which is why we take a look at the great status of this personality that Allah gave him for what he sacrificed. When Imam Hussein was leaving the city of Medina and he went to bid farewell to the graves of his family, he went to the grave of Imam Hassan. He went to the grave of his mother Fatima. He went to the grave of Rasulullah. And when he sat by the grave of Rasulullah, they said he wept and he spent his time in ibadat until eventually he lost consciousness or he fell asleep. And in his dream, he saw Rasulullah and he said, Oh Father, I am in a state of tribulation and difficulty. And Rasulullah replied to him, Oh Hussein, I will see you soon. You are coming to me now. Imam Hussein complained, he says, Ya oh Father, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you let me just stay in your grave? Why must I go out and face these difficulties again? Let me come to you now and let me leave this place now. Rasulullah replied, O oh Hussein, Allah has designated for you a place in heaven that is so high that it cannot be reached except by you giving a great sacrifice. And Imam Hussein knew that a sacrifice is coming from him and that that sacrifice, Allah would reward him for it. The same way we talked about that these statuses in the ziyarat of Imam Hussein or the love of Imam Hussein, that there's a cure in his grave, that there is the answering of the dua under his dome, that Allah designated him the father of the rest of the a'imma, were the rewards that he reaped for the sacrifice that he gave on the day of Ashura. People sometimes they make a question and they say that, Are, isn't it that we are raising Imam Hussein because even in his turba is a cure that doesn't exist even in the grave of Rasulullah? Are we raising Imam Hussein to a status higher than Rasulullah? And the answer is no. That Rasulullah's flower, the flower of the plant that is Rasulullah is Imam Hussein. That just because their attributes are different doesn't mean one is greater than the other. All of their origination and status comes from Rasulullah. The sacrifice of Imam Hussein is in the protecting the message of Rasulullah. How can he be greater than Rasulullah? Which is why on the 9th of Ashura, when Umar Sa'd came and wanted to begin the fighting, Imam Hussein said, give us but one more night that we may worship Allah in this night. That we may attain proximity through, to Allah through the religion of Rasulullah. This is that night of ibadat. This is that night of worship. This is that night where Imam Hussein, the camp of Imam Hussein, they said there was a constant hum coming from this camp as people spent the entire night in prayer and worship and recitation of Quran. Though they knew tomorrow we will leave this world, we will be shaheed in the way of Islam. They still said we love Allah so much that we want time to worship. Therefore, if you want to be in the camp of Imam Hussein in this night, 
Be careful of your actions in this night. Ensure that worship is a part of your actions in this night. This is a night of great difficulty. This is the last night on this earth that the children of Zahra are present. The moon of the Banu Hashim Abbas is still present. The, the one who was the one who looked like Rasulullah sits amongst his family tonight. That the one who looked like the new moon, the remainder of Imam Hassan is sitting with his mother tonight. That the companions who love the Imam are with them tonight. This is a night of great difficulty and ensure that this night is not spent like other nights. On this night, after they had received the permission to have one additional night, those companions of Imam Hussein became worried about him, so they appointed a personality by the name of Nafi ibn Halal, who was an archer in the army of Imam Hussein. And Nafi said, I am the security guard of Imam Hussein in this night. I will follow him around tonight and I will ensure that the enemy does not try to secretly attack and hurt our Imam. Nafi says, I spent this night with Imam Hussein, and I saw him when he began this night. He went and he checked all the tents and the encampments and made sure that the security around the tents was appropriate. Then he went through the field of Karbala to ensure that all of the places were secure. And as he would walk through Karbala, he would say, Nafi, here Zuhair will become Shaheed. Nafi, here Habib will become Shaheed. Nafi, here my son Akbar will become Shaheed. Nafi, here my son Qasim will be run over by horses. Nafi says, as I followed him through the battlefield, I heard a sound that disturbed my heart and made me weep. I asked, Ya Imam Hussein, what is this sound? Are you in danger? Is there someone coming? Imam Hussein said to me, Nafi, ignore this sound. I said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, by your right, I have been chosen to defend you in this night. Tell me what it is, it disturbs me. Should I be prepared for it? He says, Nafi, the same way I show you the places of the shohada, my mother Zahra sits on the place of my shahada and weeps. Nafi, don't pay attention to my mother Zahra's crying as she weeps where I will be martyred. Nafi says, I followed Imam Hussein when he came back to the tents. I followed him as he went to the tent of Sayyidah Zainab. When he went inside, I heard a conversation between Bibi Zainab and her brother Imam Hussein. She says, brother, is it true that that time has come that your sacrifice will be presented? Tomorrow is truly tomorrow the day of Qiyamah for us that it will be a day of difficulty. Imam Hussein replied, yes, my sister, tomorrow is that day of difficulty. She says, brother, are these companions of yours sincere? Will they stay with you tomorrow? Have you tested them? Will they stand to defend you? Nafi says, I was standing outside of this tent and my heart jumped in my chest that the daughter of Zahra is questioning our sincerity. The words would not come to my tongue. I was frustrated. I went to our leader, Habib ibn Mavahir, and I told him that I heard Zainab question our sincerity. Habib stood up in anger. He stood outside of his tent with his spear in his hand. He called out, O lions and defenders of the Banu Hashim, come from your tents. Habib, your leader calls you. All of these companions ran from their tents. They were worried that an attack happened. Every soldier came with a sword or came with a spear. When the Banu Hashim came, Habib said, Banu Hashim, our request is not from you. Please wait, nothing wrong has happened. They stood outside of the tents of Sayyidah Zainab. Habib called out, Sayyidah, if you question our sincerity, we are here to defend our master. If Allah was to allow us to die 1,000 times, and our bodies were cut to pieces 1,000 times, and we were allowed to come back to life 1,000 times, O oh, Sayyidah, we swear to you, we would never leave Hussein. Our lives sacrificed for our master. Sayyidah, don't doubt our sincerity. We will never leave Hussein ibn Ali. Imam Hussein replied to them, he said, O oh lions, go back to your tents, go back to your worship. I have no doubt about your love for me and your position with me. Go back to your ibadah. Nafi says, after this, I continued with my master. As we went through the tents, we could hear from each tent the sound of a mother preparing her children for the next day of the battle. We could hear from every tent a wife preparing her husband for the battle. We could hear a sister giving confidence to her brother until we saw one tent where Abu al-Fadl was entering and from inside was coming the crying of Umm Kulthum, the sister of Abbas. We heard a conversation, Abbas enters, my sister, what makes you weep? Abbas is alive. 
the defender of your hijab is still here. Why do you cry in this night? Umm Kulthum replied, O Abbas, every mother is preparing her child. Every sister is preparing her brother. Every wife is preparing her husband. Abbas, tomorrow I have no sacrifice to present in front of my brother Hussein ibn Ali. I have no children, I have no spouse. What sacrifice shall I present on the day of Ashura for the protection of my brother Hussein? They said, Abu al-Fadl kneeled in front of Umm Kulthum, put her hands, put his hands in front of her. He said, oh sister, tomorrow I am your sacrifice for our brother Hussein. Tomorrow I will stand for you, Umm Kulthum. Don't worry, as long as Abbas is alive, you will have a sacrifice to present for our brother. There was one other tent where a lady was crying that the lack of sacrifice that she had to present. This was a mother who sat over a cradle and wept. Oh, Asghar, every mother is preparing her child to fight tomorrow. My Asghar, you are so small. I have no sacrifice to present. And this mother wept to see that there was no sacrifice. Imam Hussein entered this tent. He said, Rabab, tomorrow your sacrifice will be the greatest. Rabab, Allah will accept from you a sacrifice unlike he is not accepted from anyone. Rabab, don't worry. Your son is also mentioned amongst the shuhada. The day of Ashura came. The companions were spent. The children were spent. Abbas went to sleep by Furat and would not answer the call of the Imam. The Imam stood in front of the tent alone. He called out, Hal min nasir in Is there no one to help me? A cry came from inside of the tent. The Imam came inside, women, why do you weep? Hussein is alive. They replied, it is Asghar. He said, did Asghar die from thirst? Remember, they were thirsty for three days. A grown man thirsty for three days in the desert of Iraq has a hard time staying alive. This was an infant of six months who was thirsty for so long. One of the narrators, he says, Imam Hussein asked, did he die? They said, no. But when you called for assistance, this child who is so weak he could not move, rolled himself over in, the, in his cradle. We imagine maybe these were the throes of death, so we cried. Imam Hussein said, give my son to me. Imam Hussein takes this six month child in his arms. And he says to the women, let me take him and let's see if maybe they will give him some water. Some of the khutaba they narrate that the children on this began to weep and argue with Imam Hussein that this young daughter of four years old came to her father and said, Baba, don't take my Askha. Anyone who goes with you never comes back. Don't take my Askha. Imam Hussein tells this small child and tells the children, children, don't worry. I'm going to ask for water for this child. I'm going to get him water and then I'm, I'll bring him back. They describe that Imam Hussein, when he takes this child, he took this child and tucked him into his Aba. To protect this young child from the heat of the sun, Imam Hussein, when he took Asghar to the battlefield, he covered him with his cloak so that the sun would not beat down on this child. The example of him walking to the battlefield with this child, the enemy assumed that Imam Hussein has brought the Quran with him to debate with them. And they said he has brought the Quran with him. But when Imam Hussein came forward, he removed his cloak and brought out a child. And he began to speak to the army. He said, oh, enemies of Islam. He says, if I have committed a sin or a problem and you have a fight with me, this child is innocent. This child is in a condition where if you give him water or you don't give him water, he's going to die anyway. Don't let him die thirsty. Give him some water so that he dies with peace. The army now began to debate. The great fight of Asghar was that he broke the ranks of the army of Umar Sa'd like no one else could. 
Half of the army said, it's an innocent child. It can't even speak. Give it some water. The other half of the enemy called out, he is from the progeny of Hussein. We will send them to hell, but we will never give them water. The two began to argue, are you that cruel? Are you that unjust that you want to kill a child? And the other said, he is from Hussein's lineage. He deserves nothing. Imam Hussein, seeing the army argue, he said, listen, if you worry that when you give this child water, I will drink it, I will put him down here on the ground, and you can give him water. Oh, Abba Abdullah, a moment ago you protect this child from the hot sun above. Now you put him on the burning ground of Karbala. And you stood and you waited, and we don't know how long you waited. How difficult, Hussein ibn Ali, your infant son, you laid him on the grounds of Karbala, that maybe one manloom would give him water. And the army continued to fight. Umar Isad saw that this argument about this child is going to break the ranks of my army and we will have a civil war amongst ourselves. So he turned to Harmala. He said, Harmala, you are the best archer in the army. Finish the speech of Hussein ibn Ali. In the meanwhile, Imam Hussein raised Asghar to his arms again. How long he waited with Asghar on the ground, I don't know. But I imagine the pain he felt as his child. How did he come from Asghar? Wait but a moment, maybe they'll give you water. Then he picked up his child. Asghar in a state of thirst began to rub his tongue over his dried lips. The enemy seeing this child on the verge of death. Some argued and fought with others. Harmala raised an arrow. There's a very clear description. He raised the largest, heaviest arrow he had. Why did they mention why, which arrow he raised? In one opinion that I imagine is, is that this target that he had was very small. So he hit it with the largest object he had to ensure he hit his target. He said, Hurmala waited. The poets narrate, they say, did he not have any shame? Was there nothing to stop him? Did he not see that maybe Rasulullah put his neck next to the neck of Asghar? Harmala shot the arrow. He pierced the neck of Asghar in the arms of his father. There's a description. When today we make the swing, the crate of Asghar, we put doves in the swing sometimes. Why do you put doves in the swing? One of the reasons I'll tell you. Because when Asghar was hit with the arrow, he flapped in the arms of his father. Like a bird flaps. The child convulsed in his father's arm. How about Abdullah calmed his child? Asghar, be patient. The pain is stopping in a moment. Asghar convulsed. Abba Abdullah gave patience. Asghar became shaheed in the arms of his father. They said that the arrow pierced the neck of Asghar from one ear until the other. The blood of Asghar flowed. Abba Abdullah said, bear witness. Allah, they killed children like this. Imam Hussein turned back to the tents. And this is a famous a'mal he will perform in the morning. Seven times he went forward. Seven times he came back. Why? One explanation could be every shaheed, his family was given the right to weep over him. Abba Abdullah wanted to give the right of Asghar, the right of the mother of Asghar Rabab, the right to weep over Asghar. But he had told the children that I will get Asghar water. Now if he entered with the shaheed into the tents, what would happen to those small children when they saw that they even kill infants? So Abba Abdullah seven times he tried to present the shaheed. Seven times he came back until eventually he called out, Rabab, come out of the tents and meet your Mashahi. Abba Abdullah on the day of Ashura dug only one grave. He took this shaheed, he didn't bring him to the tents. He went behind the tents and he dug a grave. Now the poets describe. The poets describe, they say we see Hussein ibn Ali digging a grave with Dhul Fiqar, and we see the Dhul Fiqar weeping on the day of Ashura. There are only two things in history that the poets said were so oppressed that they would weep for the one that they were with. One was the earrings of Fatima that were broken in her ears when her face was struck by the Mal'oon. The other is the sword Dhul Fiqar that was used to dig the grave of Asghar. They say we see the Zulfiqar weeping. I was created for the defense of Islam, not for burying the children of Rasulullah. 
Imam Hussein dug a grave, the poet describes. He says Imam digs a grave, he puts the child inside. He fills the grave in from the feet. He fills the grave in from the legs. He fills the grave in from the chest. And when Imam Hussein comes to cover the face of Asghar, he begins to weep. And the poets describe, we see Imam Hussein saying, Oh Asghar, your skin is so soft and the sands of Karbala are so hot. How do I cover your face with the hot sand of Karbala? Imam Hussein made this grave, why? Maybe it was to protect the children from seeing this mazloom. Maybe it, because, it was because he knew after his shahada, all of the heads of the shahada would be collected. And he did not want this infant son of his to be desecrated. But hi Hussein, wa asghara. When they collected the heads, one mal'oon called out, We've collected all the heads but one. There was the sacrifice of Hussein that he presented in the form of an infant. Another mal'oon called out. He buried him behind the tents. They said, find his body. How do you find the body of an infant in the sand? These mal'oon took their spears, started to stab the sand. Eventually, this small body was raised on a spear.